You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. How you're doing? Welcome once again to another edition of the Way of the Desert and Tosi Radio. Today is Wednesday, April 10, 2013. And hi, Heather Ash. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everyone. We are very blessed to have another amazing guest on this duo show. And that's Jacob Nordby. So welcome, Jacob. Hello. Thank you. Hey, Jacob, welcome to the show. So happy to have you on. And I'm so looking forward to talking to you today because I love your book, The Divine Arsonist. It's awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've been excited to uh, be with both of you. Cool, cool. And, uh, you know, I have to say in reading your book, I, I, it's, there, are certain, there are so many parts where it was a catalyst for action. Even for me, like, for me, like I saw myself in the mirror and I'm like, you're right. You know, that, that conversation that you had in, in the book, and I'm, I'm going to go just straight into it because your book, it makes me, made me want to process almost immediately. Mm. And it's a part where you, 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 after you've, uh, you came back from that weekend up in the mountains and you're facing all your creation and the responsibilities that you're facing. And right before the show, we were talking about detachment mm. and that aspect of the book where you're talking about, you know, having to make a choice of, of whether you're going up again or not and talking to your wife and talking to your partners and talking to your, uh, your, your friend next door over a cigar and talking about those, uh, those responsibilities. It's an impressive process that you were going even before you went up to the hill um, in your book, The Divine Arsonist. And I want to ask you if you can walk us through that mental process of facing your own creation and having to face the responsibilities of one, your creation, but also at that precipice of, of change. Wow. Yeah. Well, and, and thank you uh, very much. And by the way, bef before I go um, there, I just want to say both of you, uh, Heather Ash and, and Miguel, uh, your books, you know, resonated so strongly with me as I read them um, just recently. And fascinating because after some of the events uh, that, that were turned into a, a fictional story with the Divine Arsonist, um, I actually went and was trying to figure out what happened. <laughs> and so um, I went and did a, a lot of study in Castaneda and various, you know, many, many other areas just to try to find out what actually, what actually took place there, you know, psychologically, spiritually, uh, em emotionally, all that stuff. So, but, but backing up to the point you mentioned, Miguel, um, that part of the story was, you know, again, and I'm careful to make sure people know that, you know, it is a fictional story and probably one of the more common questions I get is, did, did any of this really happen? And, yeah. and, the, answer, and the answer is, on, on the symbolic level, everything in the story happened. And I tried to find a way to express it, and I couldn't seem to do it just as a nonfiction story, so it came out as a, as a story. But yeah, the, the precipice, there was a sense of, I had this big office and a big house, and a lot of things stacked up around me, which on an intuitive level I had known for a long time, and now I'm talking about my real 
Jacob's self in the world, I had known for a long time I had been way off track, and um, the path with heart had, you know, was long gone at that point, and um, I didn't know how to find my way back to it. And that internal call, feeling like there was a door I'd been knocking on all my life, and that finally there was a chance to walk through it if I would, but the other side of it was the unknown, and that was what was so terrifying about it. And can you describe to us that 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 walk of the facing the unknown? Because you could say that that's the one of the biggest fears that we have in making any transcendental change, especially in, in our in our in all our works, in all in all three of ours. We talk about that line, that line of not knowing, but there's that call to action, that catalyst. In in that portion of the book, there you're you're describing that catalyst almost perfectly, and I can see myself perfectly well in it as well. Mm hmm. Yeah. Well, so interestingly, the known, the known for me was something which I had this, that what was interesting is the choice became crystal clear, even though the path beyond the choice wasn't clear at all. But the choice became very like in my gut heavy duty, this is a choice and you, and you have to make a choice. This isn't one of those things that you're just going to keep going along in life and, and it's going to figure itself out. Um, you really have to consciously make a choice here. And um, the one choice was to continue on with what I had always known and, and the self-concept and the activities and the way I saw the world. And the other choice was to um, leave that cycle, which was no longer serving me. And truly go outside of everything I knew myself to be. And that was probably the hardest part was to, I was very, very uh, appearance oriented. How do I appear to other people? What's my reputation? Um, do I look like a smart guy or a successful guy and all those things? Uh, do I look like a stable person? <laughs> you know, I mean, do I look <laughs> sane? <laughs> Just kind of the basics here. Um, so I was very attached to those things. And I had the sense that if I ventured down the other path, the other choice there, that some of those things would be compromised. Um, and so that, but but there was this internal knowing that this is what you've been waiting for all your life. So, you know, don't don't make this choice lightly. Beautiful. And, and as you were describing in your book, I love the moment when you had that choice. And each of us is given that choice, I think, many times in okay. our life. The choice of, do I go back to what I know? Do I stay with the familiar? Or do I step forward into the unknown? And, of course, you stepped into the unknown. And many things unfolded. And I... That's one of my favorite parts of the book is is the calling where you where you said, oh, yes, I'm going to the mountains. It makes no sense because for all of us, so often when our life is about to change, we have that sense. We have the knowing of things are about to get really interesting. <laughs> and there's the fear mm -hmm. and the knowing of everything might change if I take this step forward and the amount of courage it takes to then say, yes, I am going to take that new path and see what life brings. Yeah. Well, and you know, both of you in your books, um, I just, again, I just love, and I, I love your books because they're so, they're so practical. <laughs> they're so, um, you know, they're just so straightforward. And that was one thing I struggled with in writing this is it's just not a straightforward, you know, it's, the, the lessons don't don't come out um, in black and white with it, but but that's why I just loved both of your work. And as I read it, I just ah oh, yes, this is um, so clear. I, but the you know like in in yours, Miguel, the five levels of attachment, um, I could so easily see this um, fanatical clinging to an identity, mm -hmm. you know, and the and the painful process for me, painful, and I think more painful because I had built such a tough shell around it, and I was so desperate to to not let it do anything different. Mm -hmm. And the process of learning to just just accept, um, Heather, as you just said, what life brings. And um, in your book, Heather, where you give such beautiful processes for actually breathing through and calling on help and using symbols and tools to 
to move through these things, I think that was probably the hardest part for me in going through that process was um, I'd left the fundamentalist Christianity thing behind for some years, but I didn't really have very many tools at the time. And, um, and so that was a confusing period, and I'm just delighted there are teachers like you who are giving such practical um, modern day lessons for people who are feeling, because I think a lot of people are moving through or being called to move through some pretty big stuff right now. Yes. No, and it's true. And then, like, uh, you know, the one thing I love, I love about your book, like we're all talking about each other's books here, um, <laughs> is that, you know, if, if, if we put all three two books together, you can say that it, where, where uh, me and Heather Ashes, we, we found the practicality of it and we, we share a little story to support the practicality. Mm-hmm. What I like about in your book is that you're, it's, yeah, you're not giving the, the actual steps, but you're showing us the path mm-hmm. in the beautiful, the, the, the way you describe it, because it's so human, mm-hmm. because it's, 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 it's an aspect of life has just given me a, 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 a call to action in a way that I wasn't expecting it. It's a moment where you see all the pile up of paper in front of your desk and all of a sudden going, what is this? Mm -hmm. And having this urge to go up to the hill for the weekend and all of a sudden having this guy walk up to you and we start talking and all of a sudden just in that moment of like, here, here's this book. It's blank. It's got a couple of things here and there. Come back next week at this time. You've got a week to think about this. Mm-hmm. And the whole process, the whole week process that you go through in in that portion of the book, you can say that, yeah, where me and Heather Ash is the book that we we talk about, we, we're going through each step and we can see the reflection on each level. But the way you bring it up in the, in your, the everyday aspect of like, where do I go from here? Mm-hmm. And to me, that's what gives such a humanity to the story hmm. because you're discovering it and you're taking the steps and it's awesome. You know, that's why in, in like when at the beginning of the, this interview, I talk about that, that moment in, in, in the book where you're dealing with all your responsibilities. And I hmm. think all of us are going through those moments right now. We're like, all right, how do I want to create my own life? How am I going to make this decision responsible? Especially when you have so many people depending on us. Yeah. Yet, there's a, a call to action that might put that in jeopardy. How do I balance both? Hmm. And the way you handled it in that book is incredible. And that's what I was wanting to, I was asking. It's like, in that balance of the description, uh, you describe talking to your wife, talking to your partners, talking to your uh, secretary, I believe, or your assistant, and mm-hmm. talking to your neighbor. And from all that, everyone put it back to you, and you were making the decision. Mm-hmm. To me, that is what I would call in our tradition the path of the warrior. But you're, before you become the warrior, you become to pay attention to all the information around you. Mm-hmm. And from that, even though it's so confusing, you put it in a way that, of course, yet you're always recognizing that fear element of the unknown of what's going to happen to all these people who are depending on my decision. Yeah. And that, can you walk us through that heavy burden? Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting that I think many people find themselves, you know, in life with, um, a lot of dependencies like that and, and and the result of any action they might take to move away from how they've been uh, is just almost unbearable. In my case, I had some particular patterns. Um, the oldest child had always been the golden boy and had always behaved responsibly. So there were some really strong patterns that weighed against any major change in my life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I had plenty of people around me who didn't necessarily carry those particular patterns and they several of them had been telling me for some time it's your life you have to make a decision and if you're off track you need to go ahead and and you know make this decision as best you can um but for me it was a extremely agonizing process i thought it was going to be impossible frankly 
Um, and I, I'm really careful to tell people nowadays when they come and ask me, because some people will read the book and they'll come and ask me about, you know, what actually happened. And um, the truth is I did go through quite a process of, of um, you know, shutting down a business and, and a variety of other things, which, which was pretty um, traumatic and dramatic at the time. And sometimes people will come and say, is that what I need to do is just shut everything down and, you know, let the chips fall. And um, one thing I'm really careful to say these days is please don't use this as a template for the way it has to be. I think many people oh, yeah. agree. can make a shift much more gracefully than I did. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I agree with you there. And let's wish everyone gentle transitions, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and that was a beautiful thing because in in the reflection I saw and because in 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 the book the the, the protagonist the main the main uh, person is asking for advice and I love what the neighbor says oh you're not pinning this on me you got to make this decision <laughs> and everything around you even even the characters up in the hill are all all putting it back and it is something that even as a reader, like you, you hit in, in the right in the head right now. Even when they're asking us, you know, they, I'm, I'm sure Heather Ash has gotten this question, and I've definitely gotten it about what should they do, and the, how you describe it. You have to be careful how to portray that this is not a, a manual, but it's actually a reflection of those choices in life. But it always comes down to the individual. Yeah. How. How does one muster that self-confidence to take that decision? Wow. You know, uh, have either, has I, have you, either, wow, let me try this grammatically. Um, mm -hmm. Have you watched Cloud Atlas? I haven't. I haven't okay. either. Okay. So fascinating film. One thing that uh, stood out to me there's a heroine in the story and she at one point stands up and says something which really stuck. She said, we must do what we can't not do. Mm -hmm. And you know, when it comes down to the big decisions, so one thing to decide, Hey, this job doesn't serve me anymore. And I, I'm going to find a different job, you know, so you put the applications out and start making a shift. That's a, you know, that has a level of um, seriousness to it. But when life is trying to change in some really big way, which contains a lot of fear, just a tremendous amount of fear, um, for me it always comes down to a question of what is, the, what is the feeling of inevitability here? Um, which doesn't mean we can't make a choice. But I've had that experience a few different times in life. And one was when I left the church of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And Miguel, that was um, a level five experience for me uh, growing up in that particular religion. Um, really fanatical experience of, of attachment to a certain point of view in the world. And mm -hmm. because of that, it was also my identity. And so I, you know, I really was terrified because I, you know, I was, it was a small church, but I was kind of a big deal there. I was a song mm -hmm. leader and I did all this stuff and people depended upon me and and so when I left that, um, that, was, that was a very early experience um, in my early 20s where it came down to a question of, am I going to live truth or am I going to avoid it out of fear of all these other factors? Mm. So I, didn't, I can't claim to be courageous. Mm -hmm. I only can say that I've gone in life and not perfectly and not elegantly sometimes, but I've gone in life where truth would not let me not go. And how does one stand in that truth? How does one take that truth? Well, in my case, it it's a process of testing uh, and both of you, um, Heather, your book, I just finished more recently. Um, and you just have some beautiful tools in there about, you know, learning to listen, learning to get the information and then learning where that's going to take us, you know, and, um, and so it's not a snap thing. 
um, it's one of those things that, in, in my experience, and I'll be curious on your both of your feedback on this. Okay. In my experience, there are all these arrows, all these compass needles, pointing, and in a space of confusion uh, or you know, sort of a foggy sense, um, it can take a while to find out are they are they pointing in a common direction. There's all these indicators. And I've found that by slowing down and relaxing the story and really just being with it, 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 you know, there's going to be a sense of all these little indicators are pointing in a direction which, um, if that's the case, then that helps me start to form a decision. Mm -hmm. You you do a lot of work, both of you, with this sort of thing and, and counseling people and writing about it. What do you notice with that? Heather, you want to take it first or should I take it first? Why don't you take it first? All right. Then. I'll follow your lead. Sounds good. Well, the first thing I can think of, it's something that you wrote in your book. And it's in a stage where you're in front of the, uh, the woman and the man in the, up in the cabin. And She's, t it's about, uh, she's telling you about in this place right here, you're going to be approached by many people trying to take you in that direction and you can easily get lost because everyone wants to take you in that direction and you have to be conscious of, of that. They might lead you astray. It's that, it's that ability, like it reminds me of that agreement, the, the, the be skeptical but learn to listen, which is another thing you talk about, the automatic reaction, the automatic yes, the automatic no. Like basically with every yes I give, I manifest something with every no. I don't use my energy in that level. And when we have the automatic reaction, it's basically what we know, what we have, that kind of drives us to take that, those actions for us without us thinking. It's comfortable. So... The, having the ability to be skeptical is to, to withhold those yeses and noes and have, be able to, to listen. You talk about that uh, uh, in the book and it's basically about level fives as you described before. In life there are many arrows that takes us in many directions. The question will come down to telling the difference between is it an arrow that's talking about the truth and talking about a distortion and illusion an illusion that we want to believe so much. And it really comes down to that. Do I really want to believe it so much because it makes me feel comfortable? But sometimes seeing the truth is something that allows us a certain discomfort mm -hmm. because it is so tied to the unknown. Mm -hmm. And like right now I'm working on the book called Living a Life of, uh, uh, of Awareness. And I use the image, exactly what you're describing here, of, uh, but similar, of Don Quixote at that moment when he faces the windmills and he faces the giants. Mm -hmm. He has a choice. There's a moment of clarity. Life just hit him with a, the with a propeller of a windmill and threw him down to the, to the ground. And there's a moment of choice for Don Quixote to choose to believe that these were giants and to continue to identify himself as Don Quixote or to accept the truth that these are windmills and his real name is Don Alonso Quijano. You see, the identity there is different. One is an image we want to project, and the other one is an image of who we really are. Mm -hmm. So as the, as the arrows that are pointing in, in life, the very first question would be, are these arrows heading towards giants or are they heading towards the windmill? When, meaning by that, are they heading towards an illusion that I want to believe so much? Or is it heading towards the truth of my life? So in standing in my truth and understanding that, that ability to follow the path and follow the sign is, starts by recognizing the, the only truth I know for fact, which is I am alive. And accepting that I am alive al allows me that one clear acceptance of self. From that the choice is, is up to the individual. Each one of us will follow whichever one we prefer, obviously. But how can we tell when the arrows are pointing in that direction comes from that acceptance of who we are and what we are and learning to accept ourselves allows us to recognize the arrows 
Because life, like you said, Jacob, is teaching us all the time. It's the one that just takes us and just grabs it, like you said in the book. So life will always have this knocking on us for giving us these arrows. The question is whether or not we are able to recognize them. Mm, yeah. And are, are we willing to recognize them? Because life, life is the greatest teacher we have. And that's what life, what, that's where truth comes from. You can say that there's the truth that we know that we are life and everything else is just an agreement, an agreement of what is the truth. When we look for truth through knowledge, the problem with knowledge is that it's completely subjugated to the agreement of the people who is involved, which means it can ch change and shift so many times. So the question there is, is these arrows that life is pointing mean something that reflects my truth and I accept that truth? In which case, the only thing I requ requ is required of me is saying, yes, I'll follow or no, I won't follow. Or can I be like Don Sancho Panza, who's Don Quixote Squire? I know I'm crazy, but I'll follow me just in case I'm right. <laughs> yeah. And so, so that that's really the question. And you know, the in in the book how you describe it, everyone pointing it back to you. Mm. You know, from your wife pointing, making like you know, you're you're reaching out to the, your wife and saying, "What should I do?" And it's like, "I can't do." It. Even though she's crying mm. and she's trying her best to express what she wants, she, she knows in this position is your choice. Your neighbor says you're not pinning pinning it on me, but here is your choice. Your 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 partners in the business. It all comes down to you. And also when you make the choice, you have a dream about fire mm -hmm. and other buildings. It's the moment you've made your decision. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important. Yeah. The moment you make the decision is when the, the whole world sh changes and shifts. Yeah. And if we're ready, willing to listen to life teach us, boy, does it have a, a lesson to mm -hmm. share. So it always comes down. No one can ever make a decision for us. It is our, it is our life. Mm -hmm. Because if we're going to wait for someone to choose for us, then we can easily pin on someone else and we give away responsibility. But are we really living our life when that happens? Yeah. At that point, I'll tag team Heather. <laughs> tag. <laughs> tag. What? What arose for me is a teaching that I learned many years ago that really ties into this. And it was from one of my first teachers, Kara Dwin. Her father was a rocket scientist. And I love this. She was a very metaphysical, uh, very spiritual person and had very scientific parents. And she took one of the teachings from him and applied it to life in such a beautiful way. And what he told her was that Heat-seeking missiles are off target 99.5% of the time. And we all go, what? How can they be off target if they're a heat-seeking missile and they hit their target every time or almost all of the time? And it's because a heat-seeking missile has a focus. It knows where it's going. It's seeking where the heat is. So it's, it's heading towards a target, but it's constantly adjusting. And so it's heading a little bit to the right, and then it goes, oh, wait, targets to the left. And so it adjusts to the left. And then it's going to the left, and it says, oh, wait, targets to the right. And so it zigzags. And as we live our life, we're constantly zigzagging. We're making mm -hmm. choices that take us a particular direction. If we don't know what our intent is, we don't know where our, we're going or what our focus is, we'll tend to just wander. Life will teach us, definitely. And if, our, if what we're wanting is to stay comfortable, life will help us to stay comfortable because that's what we want. That's what we'll gear ourselves towards. Mm -hmm. If we're wanting to know the truth, life will help bring the truth to us. If we want to continue to believe our lies, then we'll filter everything. So when we get clear about what our intent is, and I can remember moments in my life, and I know that all of us have this experience where suddenly there's 
like a feeling of a bell or a sense of knowing that we shift our intent mm -hmm. and that we say, this is my intent. I want the truth. I want my authenticity. I want to be happy. I want to bring more love into my life. Whatever that new intent is, there's a clarity and we say yes mm -hmm. to something. And then we watch our choices and we ask, as just as you were saying, Miguel, we keep asking, is this choice bringing me closer to that truth? Is this choice bringing me closer to being more loving in the world? Whatever our intent is. And then we adjust. So yes, it's supporting that or oop, no, I need to make an adjustment. And sometimes we make choices when we're not paying attention that we need to, and then we go way off target. So I'll just pause here. Thank you, Ken, for reminding me. I'll just pause here. For any of you that are joining us now, this is Heather Ashamara with TOSI Radio, joined with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. of Way of the Desert, and our guest today, Jacob Nordby, who has written a book called The Divine Arsonist and also is featured in a Hierophant book on pearls of wisdom. Mm -hmm. So as we, when we get clear about what our intent is, then we open our awareness and adjust our direction. And we'll find that there's places where we've been way off target. And the more lovingly and with presence, we can create that adjustment. And it, it really doesn't help when we wake up and realize, wow, I'm not living my life. I'm not in alignment with what my actions are. Mm -hmm. For us to then go into huge judgment against ourselves. Because that keeps us off course. That keeps us going in a direction that doesn't serve us. But when we can know that... We're always constantly adjusting. We're always going to make mistakes. We're always going to fall asleep and wake up and fall asleep and wake up. And in the waking up, if we can go, yay, I'm awake again. Okay, what was my intent? What was it, what was it that I was moving towards? Then we can course correct quite easily. So I'm a big fan of tr when we're creating transformation in our lives of getting clear first, what's my intent? And that can be what our biggest intent is, is in our life. And it might be a very tiny intent. What's my intent today? Mm -hmm. And if you know what your intent is in any moment, then you can redirect yourself, redirect, redirect, and be in forgiveness and humor and immense patience for ourselves when we're off course and make the redirection more gentle and graceful. And you know, as you were saying, Jacob, for people that have been through really huge transformations, like you write about in your book, that we wish that people would never go have to go through that. Because when you're in the middle of a big transformation, it's like, please, can't this be easier? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. And we all laugh. <laughs> For some of us, it takes the tsunami. It takes the tornado. It takes the fire. It takes something huge to shake us off of the familiar. And... We pray for everyone else and for ourselves in the future as well that we can let transformation be more gentle. Mm -hmm. So even if the transformation's intense, we can learn to be more gentle with ourselves. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I just love the, the gentleness message here. Um, and I don't think that I think a lot of people are taught not to be, you know, and um, so that is such a, a valid and needed message about just being gentle with ourselves, with the process. Um, I'll never forget 
uh, one of my teachers who came along during this period of time and, and actually said that to me very directly. In fact, uh, and also my sister, who's a beautiful teacher of mine, she, she came to me one time and said, Jacob, be gentle with yourself. This is big stuff. And, um, you know, I was so perform- performance oriented and all that, that it was, it was hard for me to let myself go through this stuff and, and not, and as you just said, Heather, not, um, not judge it, not judge the process, not judge myself as being uh, a total mess and all that, even though there were, there were aspects of that. <laughs> but but that's, the, that's, the, that's the thing is that sometimes we forget, like we're so accustomed to that judgment because we think it should be this way. And sometimes it, it, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's a, it's when, when, when you let go, like for example, like that, in, in, the, in the story when you were, you were, when you were driving up, when, uh, you know, after uh, the car accident in, in, the, uh, in the book, and you're describing about how to, the process of, uh, I forgot the ceremony you were describing in your old church about how to let go and, and, and surrender mm-hmm. to, to God, to the, to, the, to the plan. I forgot. What was the name of that ceremony, do you remember? Oh, you mean in the, in the old, in the church? Yes. So that there, you know, it was, it's, um, you, you go down to the altar and, and, you know, kneel down and pray in front of everyone. And, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. And then you were, you were saying about, you had to reach that moment of that moment of clarity and knowing about that surrender and, and your friend chuckles. <laughs> he says this, the, the irony of, of, of talking about surrender. Mm-hmm. When we judge ourselves, you know, it's, and we judge ourselves for the process we're in, when we judge how, we, don't be too hard on yourself. It's that moment of surrendering that allows us to recognize that things are happening as they should be. Mm-hmm. But it's a part of us that judges it because we need it to be the way it sh- it, we think it has to be and we punish ourselves for it deviating, like that heat heat seeking mix missile, like if it auto corrects itself every time, and every time it auto corrects itself, it judges itself so harshly for even going in that direction. Mm-hmm. Eventually, one can lose total focus about where we're going because we're so hard on ourselves and judging why that was I going that direction. Don't you see that that body was going in that direction? And you're totally going the wrong way, so we're autocorrecting, autocorrecting, autocorrecting. But if if there's self-judgment every time we autocorrect, it's going to take a lot longer to hit our target because we're too busy judging ourselves for that autocorrecting. And that moment of of surrendering, basically, to me, it means the moment of where we accept the truth. This is the direction I was going in. It was the right path at that moment. But every, but the goal shifted. The body shifted. The heat sensing uh, focal changes. So the truth changes continuously. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, if we are so hard on ourselves, judging ourselves, sometimes that judgment is the thing that veers veers us off course. Mm-hmm. Because it takes us away from the focal point of where we're working towards. Yeah, and if if I may, one big thing that has informed me um, as I've made transitions, you know, since uh, the ones we t- we're talking about here, mm-hmm. has been if we if we start to get that sense, that inevitable sense that this is a big one, and I, I have to make a real choice. Um, what I've noticed is helpful is to once I get some level of real you know, clarity that, okay, that this, this step in this direction feels right right now is to go ahead and take a step and then stop and breathe. <laughs> um, take action, uh, go ahead. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking about practical stuff. If it's changing a job or, you know, I mean, what are some other, just out of curiosity, because I know sometimes we can talk in concept, but what are some real life things people come to you about all the time, either of you? The real ones that I get, uh, for example, uh, job, you know, it's like, am I, am I, this job is making me completely unhappy and what, what should I do with my life? And I have a family, I've got kids, how should I 
continue life and still be able to f be free with all these responsibilities. Other, and the other options are basically all about relationships. Uh, should they stay or should they go and all that kind of thing. <laughs> but it, um, um, it's almost those two things, almost always those two things, the responsibilities of my work, you know, in, 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 the, in the various people we meet and where they're at in their relationships. So those are the two main ones I always get. Mm -hmm. yeah. Heather? Yeah, those two for sure. And also around how to create more time for spirit, for more space. Like so many of us are overwhelmed. That's a big, a big one I get. So similar to what Miguel was saying. And also around speaking truth. Like how do you not take things personally and how do you speak your truth when other people get upset by it? Mm -hmm. How do you start living your authenticity when people expect you to be a certain way and you start to change? Yeah. So there's some... And, and well, basically... Those... Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I want to hear... Well, it, it always comes down to that, you know, it's like it, it's, it, it's never the same answer because every individual is different. You know, it's like there's, there's the obvious aspect of what are we attached to or how, what does that say about us and how to take things personal and how to be impeccable with the word. Mm -hmm. And it always comes down to an individual and how they see life and how they see themselves. Are they doing it because they have to or are they doing it because they want to? And right there, it, it always comes down to those two things. And the answer is always... Almost, almost every time, they rarely do things because they want to. They're almost always doing it because they have to. They believe this is what I have to do. Even looking for their own personal freedom is something they believe they have to do. Hmm. And that's where, in my point of view, all the distortion happens. Mm -hmm. When we think we have to do it, well, there's no, there's no love behind it. Because, well, there is love, but it's conditional love. Mm -hmm. which is opposite of unconditional love, which is the expression of that I want to. I want to do it so badly because that's what I love to do. Mm -hmm. And we're always torn apart because the conditional part of it comes as, oh, this is what I have to do and I have to do it because, well, like in your book says, I'm responsible. I'm responsible for all these people. All these people are depending on me. I've never taken some time off. Like I'm, 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 I'm paraphrasing your book right here. I've never taken some time off. I'm, I'm, I'm way overdue for a, of a vacation. No one has even taken some time off because this is such an important, crucial time. And the thing is that it's always a crucial time. It never stops being a crucial time. Yeah. And the question lies, whether in relationships, whether and and with work, or whether in their school or whatever. What's the difference between doing something we love to do and the responsibilities of I have to based on our conditions? Mm -hmm. To me, you could say all of the other stuff boils down to that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, in, in terms of um, what's interesting is when we're going through a highly charged situation where there are a lot of dependencies and there are a lot of expectations – um, in my experience, when we take a step that may not be popular with those around us, um, then, then there's another set of, of sometimes confusing emotions and feelings. Um, and so that's why, in my experience, taking a good strong step of some kind uh, in the direction that feels right uh, and, and as defined by what you both said, um, and then stopping take a breath, look around. And I'm talking about, you know, take a day, go sit in the mountains, um, you know, something like that and say, okay, now that I've taken this bold step, this step of truth, how does it feel? Is a, is a course correct in order? Um, or do I need to take the next step? And I'll never forget something uh, a business teacher of mine once taught me and, it, and it's really helped me a lot down through the years in terms of speaking truth. And I think this becomes such a critical aspect. Once we know the direction 
uh, the path with heart, um, we're generally going to have to communicate that to those around us, especially if there are dependencies. And it seems like if there aren't any dependencies, then probably it's not going to be a very big deal. So, um, but in terms of speaking the truth, this guy said, uh, because I was, I was very bound up with being so diplomatic and being a nice guy and all this and didn't want to hurt people's feelings. And, and so I found myself uh, really not able to express myself truthfully a lot of the time. And um, this guy said, Jacob, if you feel it, say it gently. Mm-hmm. If you feel it, say it gently. And he said, your, your problem in life isn't the gently part. Your problem is if you feel it, say it. <laughs> mm-hmm. He said, other people in life have to learn the gently, but that's not your problem. You need to say what you feel, and it's probably going to come out gently. Um, but that was really useful for me. And so it's really it's been a, a tool I've used down through the years since then and learned how to use it better um, of, of speaking what is true inside and allowing, surrendering the outcome of that. Um, say what's true and then allow, allow the perceptions of others to have their own, um, have their own path. And then we, we come into genuine conversation then, you know, to me, that's the, to me, that's the epitome of being a pickle with a word, like mm. in speaking our truth, not necessarily, like, not necessarily how we s- say it, you know, like with the gentle part, mm-hmm. but being completely, an understanding of how we we are going to use this life energy, this living being that's me, and use it to create. And it often starts from that moment of speaking your truth. This is this is what I feel. This is how I'm expressing. This is what I want in life. Because from that expression, well, that's where that's the beginning part of all our, all our manifestation in life. Mm-hmm. And if we're going to uh, approach it with insecurity, then life will be insecure, always full of fear. Mm-hmm. But if we say it with confidence and trust, then it doesn't mean we're going to not correct. We're going to be continuously correcting, but with the complete awareness that with every action, with every correction we take, we're living life. And then there's the other aspect of only making our decision because I've got so many responsibilities that I'm bound up so tightly, like mm-hmm. like you described with bungee cords mm-hmm. in your book, that I don't even know how to even breathe. Mm-hmm. And how you describe it, going outside, taking a step, taking a deep breath of air, really does help. As simple as it is, I think it's one of the most powerful thing tools we we have to understanding and becoming aware of this intent that we have, which is life. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and one of the things that I, if I can shift just a minute here, um, one of the things I love so much about what came out for me, and that I see reflected in both of your work too, and uh, your teachings. I started writing this book with this big urgency. Uh, you know, at the time, I was really concerned about the way the world was, and you know, we're, we're headed for something. And I, I really felt um, that it was going to end with some big message. You know, it's gonna, mm-hmm. <laughs> it's gonna be a call to action for the world or for myself or something. And so I was surprised um, by the ending and by the the way that the character was sent back to the world. And they said basically. Um, Look, the greatest gift you can give the planet right now is to keep waking up and then walk in love. Mm-hmm. And and I love how the the two of you describe it and teach it. Um, Miguel, in your book, the you know five levels of attachment, where you talk about living is art. It's art, um, and understanding that to express ourselves and be here fully, that's a form of art, and that is that is success when we boil it right down, that is successful living is to turn it into art, something beautiful, something real. Um, and Heather, you, in your work, in your fire walk, which I, I, I told before the show, I'm really hoping to bring you to Boise and share you with, uh, hopefully both of you actually, share you That'd with the cool. crowd around here. <laughs> um, just the joy of it, because, you know, we've been talking about some heavy stuff and some stuff that people 
um, as I was, and I'm sure as you both have experienced, you know, t- at times these things are very heavy and very deep. Um, but the beauty of it, the excitement of it for me is that on the other side of fear is, and the fire walk is such a powerful symbol of that. I just love the, I love the feeling, Heather Ash, uh, on the other side of the fire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that joy, that, 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 um, celebration of who I am, who we all are, as greater than the fear. And so on the other side of that fear, of that radical honesty, of those big steps or, or the, the many little steps or whatever it takes, is, is greater strength, greater joy, greater authenticity, only every time though. Yes, exactly. And it's, we want to be really careful not to get caught up in the struggle to be better or the work to be awakened or the fight to get out of our belief systems because we can just get caught in that old matrix of we're not good enough, we have to keep working, um, everything's a struggle and make that our spiritual path. <laughs> and that we're walking a path of healing in order to let go of what's not us to let go of the beliefs and the drama and the struggle. And that on the other side of that is beauty, is joy, is openness. And that for all of us, there's different firewalks in our life. The firewalk is such a beautiful metaphor. And all of us have places in our life that are, we're afraid to cross. And when we move through that fear, when we're willing to face the fear and step across, keep moving, doesn't mean not being afraid, but being afraid and walking, continuing to go, then there's such joy on the other side because we step closer to who we truly are. And we see, we can look back and go, oh, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. And I want to quote something out of Jacob's book. Jacob's book is The Divine Arsonist, A Tale of Awakening. And in this fiction based on fact, based on fiction book, there's a quote (laughs) of uh, Jack, who's one of the, the main characters, the main teacher's guides, saying in his fun way, Ain't nothing wrong with manners except when they become a prison. You've been running your whole life by rules, 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 other people's rules. You think you've got no choice in the matter. Time you broke a few rules just to see how it feels. You got to live your own life. Quit worrying about what other people think all the time. And those are such great words for all of us that we live by these rules, by these beliefs, by these regulations of who we think we should be that often comes from fear of not being enough, of being rejected, of not being loved. And how liberating it is when we break the rules, when we walk across the fire, when we do something completely different to shatter the old matrix and that in that stepping forward and letting go of what others think, we can start to listen to what's true for us. And to really emphasize what you said earlier, Jacob, is that as we're making big changes, it's vital for us to stop and integrate. Mm-hmm. To stop and look and feel how, 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 was, how was that? I made this big shift. How am I feeling now? Does it feel in alignment or do I need to adjust? And no judgment. It's in alignment. Oh, I need to adjust. And we can integrate just by even in little moments during the day. Like whenever you go to the bathroom. Like at Tosi, there's a long haul before you get to the the bathroom. So I love to take that time when I'm walking down the hallway to just get quiet and just feel how how's my body feeling? What am I? How am I acting? How's my energy? And so we can find those break points throughout our day to come back to ourselves. And if you can take a day, even better. Integration is such an important part of transformation. Yeah. 
Hello. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what I love about today's show is that it was more of a round table than an interview. It was it was like all three of us just playing, and it was so much fun. Um, we've got a, like a, a five more minutes left in the show. Um, Jacob, is there anything you want to tell the audience before uh, we start just wrapping things up? Like a message. Well, first of all, just a big thank you. I, I'm just so honored to be here, and both of you are my heroes, and uh, I'm just so delighted to see your teaching go out in the world in the way that it is right now and look forward to sharing more of that with you. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons, and I feel like this is a message in itself, so I'm just going to say it. One of the reasons I love both of you so much, um, and I've been able to experience you in person, and that's just a treasure, is that you guys are real people and you're fun. And I think that's such a needed thing right now um, as people are moving through, as I am moving through, as we all are moving through our stuff and continuing on down the path, is your message is so pointed and needed and also your presence, um, the realness. <laughs> you know, Miguel, I see, I see pictures of you at, at uh, you know, hanging out with buddies, watching, watching ball games and your kids and, and all of that. And I think that sometimes as we get on this um, journey and it gets intense, um, sometimes we forget that or we place teachings and teachers on this pedestal mm, and forget yeah. that, hey, we're all fellow travelers here. And yeah. so that's really become my stance in the world is we're all fellow travelers. I'm delighted to compare, you know, compare notes from the road with everyone and, um, and learn, learn by, learn by living, learn by learned by those, all those fellow travelers I meet. So I'm just grateful to be here. Well, I'm so glad to have you. It was, uh, it's, uh, like I said before, I love your book, The Divine Arsonist, A Tale of Awakening. It's a wonderful book. And, you know, it, it's reading it. Like I felt a lot, a lot of moments of call to action. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And it woke me up and there's a lot of things. So it's, 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 it's a great book. And I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying you being my ink brother. <laughs> you know, because we all come from the same uh, a publisher, mm -hmm. but it's 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 so it's so fun to share with you and Heather Ash, a wonderful hour of enjoying and just having fun. It 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 really is the whole the whole point of this life work is to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, when we take ourselves so serious, it's it's the one of the hardest things to do is to not be serious and enjoy life. Because that's what life is. It's it's it has ups, it has downs, and I'm the one, you are the one, and we're all the ones people who are living it. So, yeah. any last things, Heather? Ash? Yeah, I'll be in the process. Sometimes I'll have people that start working doing the Toltec work, and they'll say, "Okay, so how long is this going to take?" <laughs> 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 and I just look at them and go, "Oh, honey." And they have, like two years, like six months, like when can I get free? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up with this and I'm still... <laughs> I usually giggle, exactly. I usually giggle and just go, it's not about when you're going to get there. It's about learning to love the process. And mm -hmm. that all of us, even those of us that have written books and are teaching and have lived the teachings for years, we're all still in transformation always yep. and yet we have fun and I think that's what what people I hope people will open to how can I bring the fun in and not worry about how long is it going to take yeah yeah so, so thanks I, I, to Jacob for joining us and I just wanted to say Jacob's book again is the divine arsonist and he is also one of the featured authors in a hierophant book called pearls of wisdom spiritual inspirational quotes wisdom and say, oops, nope, I'm doing the wrong thing. Boop. <laughs> 30 and inspiration then, ideas to live your best life now. There we and go. Then, and then join us next week as we have the author of the agnostic mystery, Randy Davila, on with us for the next week and the next show, who is also our publisher. Ra Jacob, thank you so much for being with us. We've run out of time. All the best to everyone. Thank you so much. And all my love to you. And the whole family, namaste. Blessings to everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jacob. Thank you.